In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Although the lessons this morning deserve great and prayerful attention, and though the events of Thursday evening in Nice linger heavily on all of our hearts and minds, I want to begin this morning on a slightly different note by telling you what a pleasure it is for me to join you at this crucial and hopeful time in the life of Calvary Episcopal Church. The kind and generous staff welcoming that I have received this week by both the staff and the lay leadership has absolutely bowled me over. All of the things that I knew to be true about Southern hospitality, and some of which I had forgotten, have been reinforced in the most delightful way. And all of that is true despite the fact that I, with my not particularly young and fresh face, am stepping into the shoes of one whose face was utterly fresh and young. I got to know and love Chris over the last year or so as we have come in and out of Memphis. And in fact, long before I met him, I kept hearing about him from my old friend, Mimsy Jones, known to most of you. When I finally actually met him and heard him preach a year or so ago, I called Mimsy that afternoon and said, My Lord, Mimsy, he is amazing. And not only that, he's like 12 years old. (laughs) I pondered how that could be, and I'm still asking that question. What a pleasure for you to have had him these years. And let's be honest with one another. I'd rather us start out that way. What a sadness for you to have him leave. Hardly anyone likes change, and in the church world, Episcopalians are notorious, notorious, proudly so, for not wanting any of it. Being happy for Chris doesn't mean that you will not miss him, and it's okay for you to be sad about that. In fact, when I left St. Bartholomew's in Manhattan a little over a year ago, I much preferred the numerous folks who told me how sad they were. Those who felt something very much different from that mercifully kept it to themselves, and and I appreciated it. What I can tell you in all seriousness with a very full heart this morning after being here in an official way for about a week is that this place, which it is now my honor to serve for a little while, is strong, it's vibrant, and it's very much alive. Calvary's heart is clearly turned, as far as I can tell, not only toward its own, but also beyond it. Desirous of looking beyond those whom you most immediately cherish to a city and a world in desperate need of Christ's love. If we have ever needed a strong community of faith more than now, I don't recall it. It is not that we are under attack, I don't find that language particularly helpful. But this is beyond a doubt a time when the best of who we are as people of the light is called forth from us with new and urgent imperative. We who claim to be those who follow Jesus, albeit imperfectly and usually quite falteringly, are called, it seems to me, less to defend the faith less to circle our wagons than to live Jesus' truth with passion and generosity and commitment. In a word, we are called to know what matters and to give our lives to living it every day. And so it is in search of that truth that we come to these ancient lessons today, and we are not disappointed. Amos, living in the 8th century before Jesus was born, was a very angry prophet. He was, even though it was an era of relative peacefulness and prosperity in Israel, life, certainly at the high end, for those whom we would probably call the one percenters, was going along quite swimmingly. They interpreted their abundance as evidence of God's pleasure with them. Maybe the more evolved of them wouldn't exactly say it, 
but they certainly lived as though they believed it. We know something about that in our own lives and in our own time. Amos, who would actually make Bernie Sanders look like a pussycat, <laughs> would have none of that. He was mad as hops and he was telling everybody about it, absolutely unsparing in his judgment, and used this idea of summer fruit as a metaphor for the state of Israel. The Hebrew word for summer fruit is less one, though, to suggest succulence than to indicate the end of the summer, a time when the fruit is just barely this side of overripe and soon to be no good at all. Amos was clear. His oracle proclaimed that Israel had gone too far this time, rotting in its own abundance, unaware of those in desperate poverty, unseen of those for whom the good economy was in truth a life sentence of oppression and degradation. In his despair, he came to believe and to proclaim that the God of our tradition was now done with God's people, done with us. Happily for us, Amos, not yet aware of the fullness of God's good news and good intention, was wrong. God is not, God was not, God never shall be done with any of us. In truth, as I grow older, certainty is a diminishing property in my life. But of this I am quite sure. God never gives up on God's creation. Not on any one of us, nor on any part of this glorious universe. And yet, Amos' point is extremely timely for us to hear. It reminds us of what is important and that when we miss it, we miss life, not as punishment, but as the consequence of choosing to live lives not centered on true abundance, which comes only from God. In the very well-known story of Mary and Martha from Luke's Gospel, Jesus reminds us of the same thing. The story is more complicated than it first appears, and it is clearly subversive in the wonderful way that Jesus was. You didn't always know until you walked away from Jesus how extraordinary and outrageous what he said was. He was not decrying the necessity of running a good household. There is no evidence, as far as we know, that he ever turned down a well-served meal. He was not saying, as we are often told, that Mary's role was preferred because it was quiet and contemplative. Her behavior that day, in fact, was not passive. It was very active. She sat in the room with all the men. You can be sure, ruffling a lot more feathers than just Martha's. Women did not sit with men. They took care of them quickly and unobtrusively and then withdrew. Jesus' acceptance of Mary as an equal participant in learning and loving should have once and for all taken care of the question about whether there's a difference between men and women spiritually. He emphatically showed that there is not. And though that is a highly significant point, it isn't the main one of this story. The bigger one comes when we hear what Jesus actually said to Martha. Martha did not suffer quietly. She began to complain to Jesus about how Mary was not helping her. And Jesus said in very dear, dear language, Martha, dear Martha, you are worried and distracted by so many things. There is need of only one thing. What Martha was doing was not wrong. It only became wrong when her obsession with doing it perfectly kept her from remembering what really mattered. The need of only one thing. For the moment, her anxiety ruled her life and it blinded her from the goodness of Jesus' presence. That is a non-gender specific lesson for all of us. 
I know a thing or two about trying too hard, about trying to control everything in the world. And I've lost myself on many occasions to both of those things. And I expect I'm not alone in that. Jesus speaks to us today from this passage. And then finally, in an unexpected and truly marvelous moment this week, I received another reminder of all this. I happened upon a presentation being given to a group of women involved in Calvary's Lives Worth Saving program. I expect you know about it. If you don't, it is an amazing thing. It is a ministry for survivors of sex trafficking in Memphis. I heard this amazing woman stand up and tell the story of her life in just a few, a few short, wonderful remarks. She told about how she was abused as a teenager and how it had made her feel shame and worthlessness that had taken her a good long number of years to get rid of. And then she talked about learning through the love of God and the ministry of people like you about another way, another way that she could be in the world and that she could come to understand and truly believe that she was loved by God just as she is. And she didn't stop there. With deep eloquence, speaking from her heart, she told a group of women at each at a different stage on the journey that there's a better way. And I will never forget how she ended what she said. She looked at each one of them and she said, I know what your life is like, and if your God is not working for you, try mine. I will share my God with you. And in that moment, I knew that I didn't need to say anything else than that in this sermon today. That that, in a nutshell, is what is the truth about all of us. This child of God beautifully reminded me of the need of only one thing, sharing the love of God with all. That doesn't mean that we'll have all the answers to the geopolitical mess of our lives. It doesn't mean that we will automatically know how to live balanced, healthy lives in every circumstance. But it reminded me, and I hope it reminds you, that in our hearts we do know what truly matters. We are reminded of it every Sunday as we gather at this altar. Love is the answer. And while knowing the particulars of every loving decision will always be a challenge and will often, even regularly, elude us, together, together, one day, one Eucharist, one gathering at a time, we can continue to find and live what truly matters. And in the process of all of that, we shall be a part of bringing the realm of God into our own lives, into this parish, the city, and the world beyond. In the name of God, amen.